Hey guys, Loma02, uh, doing some replays so I can provide some commentary on play from 20 uh, May 2017's uh, Chainsaw Massacre with uh, Esper Control. Um, Alright, so starting hand, I believe it's a 5 lander with 2 counter spells. Uh, keepable hand, uh, don't know in the dark what he's on. See Vivid Marsh, either a budget option or a 5 color deck or 4 color deck that requires a lot of fixing. Um, could be Jund, don't know yet. Uh, not going to wasteland him here, just keep up the counter magic and uh, pass it back to him. See him cycle this card, it's a newer card. Um, I think it's a little suboptimal, so my thinking is now, like, you know, why would he be playing this card? Um... Whore of the Broken Lands. So my thinking is maybe, you know, he's taken up the, the option of using all these new cycling cards, the older ones like uh, the Glass Dust Hulk, or Glass Dust Hulk, um, to build like a Living End or Living Death dot deck, like a five-color Living Death deck, like the old Extended deck, uh, which is pretty cool. I go ahead and blow up his land here. Uh, I could have left up Dismiss, but I want to hang the Ancestral uh, Visions, um, and I know I'm not going to leave up two counter spells at this point, um, so I just leave up the Lapse and the Remand and Wasteland one of his lands. I assume his mana is going to be important to him. Then again, though, it may have been hasty to do that, but I have a lot of land regardless. I just want to lower his capacity for, count or for things I need to counter. <coughs> Excuse me. See him go up on land there with his Chartooth Cougar. Um, we go ahead and, uh, I believe, play out the Trinket Mage this turn to fetch an additional land. Uh, just leaving up just a one-mana counter. Assume his relevant cards are far less um, than our own, um, and one counter should be enough to stop him while he's on up to five mana. He does nothing, has not found his fifth mana, which means Wasteland did its job. Continue to build up our mana base. We're not going to attack with the Celestial Colonnade there, although we could. He puts 2-2 into play. Another option is here when he attacks us with his zombie uh, from that new card, Stir the Sands. We could have activated our Celestial Colonnade to kill it, but at that point I'm not leaving up Counter Magic, which I don't think is worth it. I think I'll just take 2. Um, Ancestral Visions comes off. We go up to near infinite cards. At this point, you know, we've got counter magic for days. I'm just going to leave my Trinket Mage back and block his 2-2 if he opts to attack with it. I could have unexpectedly absented um, his uh, zombie, but I didn't do that there because I kind of wanted to have the ability to leave up Mystic Confluence if I wanted to use it. When I see that land, I opt not to use it there because I want to get him with that land. I want him to attack me with that, even though I have an answer in Pi the Needle. I feel like I can buy a lot of time if I bounce that card and draw two additional cards. For some reason, he plays land uh, p prior to attacking with this card and takes the damage off of it. I don't know why. If he'd had like a Thought Seize or a Duress, that would have made more sense to me, although I could have beaten both cards. Um... We're at near infinite cards now. I believe we finally go for the Elizabeth and say, hey, we're just going to leave up one counter spell. If you've got something, if you have two somethings, then then you're going to get us. Um, so interesting line of play here. He plays out this. Uh, I figure it's going for something else that will get the living death, or living end, rather. He cascades into living end. I go ahead and I memory lapse this. Now, the psychic play would have been to negate it, so possibly I'm greedy. Um is you'll see what happens here. So there are really two cards I have to fear. Shardless Agent and then um, Merciless Brutality. Whatever that green, red, one instant is that gives everything plus one and Cascades is the card I'm thinking of. So he ends up getting um, his living end off with uh, the Shardless Agent, um, which, you know, stinks. My hope was, though, that I could trap that card on top of his deck, force him to draw it the next turn, and then it's just junk. It's, you know, it's four turn or three turns to wait for it to come off the stack. Um, but... You know, I managed to, I guess, get a little bit lucky, but probably not that lucky. I have essentially like six Wraths in the deck. Uh, I do find a Wrath my Preordain. And if I had not, the Elspeth would have removed the most significant creatures that were on the board. Um, we go ahead and cycle the Eternal Dragon. I figure I'll start getting value off that. Plus, I like to make my land drops every turn. Leave up the Torrential Gear Hulk, the Dismiss many things at this point. We see uh, Oketra's Attendant. I go ahead and just cast Dismiss at this point to, to get deeper into the deck. And we just win this turn um, with, with that card, uh, with Elizabeth, which is what she does. She just wins the game if uninteracted with. Um, so game two. We don't board anything for this. Um, initially, when you look at this, this does not like I keep, but it is when you have see the Eternal Dragon. The Eternal Dragon gives it some range, plus I have the Ancestral Visions. 
And if he ever does manage, I don't have any counter magic. Well, I have one counter piece of counter magic, but if he ever does get um, the living end off, I do have the Toxic Deluge to deal with uh, a large board presence. Go ahead and cycle the Eternal Dragon off just to get after our land drops. Our expectation is is that we were either going to use the Spell Pierce to get a living, uh, you know, something that like uh, I have to get, plus Enlightened Tutor to get an artifact land, um, or I was going to utilize the Eternal Dragon at end step. Um, here I go ahead and use my, my Enlightened Tutor to find an artifact land, the white one, Ancient Dead, I believe it is, because I want to get off the um, Factor Fiction this turn. He cycles off a few more of his cards. Yep, Jungle Weaver and Deadshot Minotaur. Those are actually playable in the modern version of this deck. We go ahead and living our correction factor fiction here, and he ends up having Violent Outburst. That's the card I was thinking of before, um, which means we assume he's going to get a living end. He unfortunately misses because he boarded that card in, I assume. I assume that card's not naturally in his deck, and he didn't hit what he wanted to there. Even if he had, though, we have decent answers in the form of Supreme Verdict, um, and now Day of Judgment, Toxic Deluge. Like I said, this deck runs a lot of sweeper effects. We go ahead and just knock this thing out now, um, only leaving up the Spell Pierce, because even if he does manage to get all that stuff back, I don't care. I'll just wrath the board. Um, we see a Boiling Seas. This is a must counter, because I don't want to lose two of my lands. Um, although I could and probably still be in the game just fine. Go ahead and cast down our Threat with Counter Magic Backup. Um, you'll see this Elsbeth. We ride this Elsbeth to victory. I think she's at like 13 or 14 loyalty counters by the end of the game. Um, so, slight misplay here. Probably should have just attacked first because we intended on making a 1-1. Uh, we get sliced and diced here, uh, which is, well, okay. You know, but we lose one of our soldier tokens, which means our clock is, is cut down a bit. Opponent continues to cycle away and just build up that graveyard. Um, they cast a deranged hermit here. We can go ahead and counter it, I believe, with the uh, cryptic command. Just to get a little deeper in the deck. Prohibit, I don't think, is an extremely relevant one here. It does get the living end in like, most of the enablers. And we see an eternal dragon come out. We go ahead and we just uh, remand this. Again, making land drops. Now we found a way to deal with the eternal dragon with the pie the needle. Which means it will be unable to get returned to hand, and it will be unable to uh, cycle for um, cycle for mana. But I don't want to show my hand yet on that. I want to just wait. We let him uh, shriek Mar card. We see a thought flare. Draw four cards and discard two cards. No, I'm not going to have that. That's that's too many cards. We see the Eternal Dragon come back, and we go ahead and just dissolve this. And we keep the Brainstorm on top with the fetch land we've aptly left in play. It'll provide us uh, some good filtration of our hand. Um, we go ahead and put back the um, the land and uh, the snare. And as you can see, Elizabeth's at 10 now. And we're just slowly using Elizabeth to grind her out, or grind uh, the player Armand out. Pie the Needle, uh, naming Eternal Dragon. I don't want to have to counter that thing every turn. It's big enough that I have to be concerned with it. And if I'm not mistaken, if I remember correctly, Pie the Needle unfortunately breaks Moto. So this may be the end of this recording right here for this first match. But to give the tail of the tape, essentially what happens is, is uh, the opponent um, eventually attempts to Living Death uh, twice. Well, not twice. Once he tries a Living Death and then uh, another time he plays, I think it's Necromancer's Cash or something like that. It's a, a very expensive enchantment that exiles all the creatures and makes two twos and they all have lifelink, two two zombies, and they all have lifelink, which we'll let them do twice uh, because we have the Day of Judgment and the Supreme Verdict. And eventually, over the course of like a 20-turn game, we grind him out with Elizabeth and really we, we end the game having counter magic in hand that we just never had to use because his threats just weren't relevant uh, opposed to the, uh, the game plan that we had. So I'm going to go ahead and, and cut this one off right here, and then we'll jump into the next match. Unfortunately, Pi the Needle breaks recordings. Um, so our next match is against C4R1S, who is on Mardu Control. Um, we have to mull down due to not having lands or the right type of lands. Um, so we go to 5, which is generally not good, but for control, it's more doable. We get Gerard's Verdict in, and we're, we're pretty sure, well, we're going to lose here. Um, we get rid of the Oblivion Ring and the Supreme Verdict and keep Negate. Uh, as soon as I see what deck he's on, he's on... So this is a deck that I've actually, I think I may have been 
I don't want to assume, but I think I may have been the um, the originator of not this specific list he's running, but the deck idea, which is to play um, is to play Mardu Control because I think it tends to beat Four Color Blood, which is a deck that's been dominant recently. Um, I see him play Mother of Runes, which I'm actually happy with because like if he's playing cards like that or creature cards, then I feel like I'll be able to get back in this game, um, even though I don't have land right now, uh, because I can just many for one him, you know, two or three for one him with a Wrath of God effect. Um, you'll note that I did not cycle the Eternal Dragon. The fear here is, is that he lands a Planeswalker threat, and I'm not able to get it with Negate. So the reason I kept Negate is because it was, ca one, castable, and two, it, it deals with uh, Planeswalker threats, which are the ones that right now, like, will I will not be able to get out of uh, get out of this rut in this game if I don't deal with. So I didn't cycle the Eternal Dragon for the same reason. Um, we see a Mother of Runes come down, and we go ahead and cycle at end step, even though I would have rather done it before. It would have been nice for the mana development. If I knew he was playing Mother of Runes and not like, you know, a Chandra, then, you know, I probably would have done it, but no one can know that. I play out my tapped land. I'm going to need my mana very heavily here. Uh, we have to counter that. Um, we don't have a way of dealing with it in hand right now, so we have to be honest with ourselves and say, hey, if we don't do that, we're just going to lose our entire mana base um, slowly and painfully, and eventually it'll just grind us out to a win. Find a poor tent. Good pickup. Go ahead and use it. Um, I do keep these, actually. Um, the Vindicate is interesting. I, I actually want that card, even though I can't cast it yet, because of its flexibility and, and capability to deal with Planeswalker threats. Because if I know anything about the deck he's playing, which is one that I think is based off of a concept or design that I had, um, the deck realistically wins off of its Planeswalkers, not its creatures. And I need to be able to answer them. Um, so I keep that card. Interestingly enough, I could play out the uh, Skull here. I don't. I just Wasteland him because he's missed a land drop, and I hit a City of Brass to keep him off double white, which means Chandra can't be cast. Or, uh, like, you know, I don't know, Chandra or Gideon's. Unfortunately, he draws another white source, which, you know, I mean, it was going to happen probably eventually anyways. I don't have a way to rapidly punish, you know, the rut he's in as far as mana goes. Um, draw Jace. I do cast him out here. You'll know I'm not going to be aggressive with the Batter Skull. Batter Skull is no good against Mother of Runes, which just needs to name Protection for Black and Protect Itself, or cards like that. His creature removal is going to be very strong. Um, he has a lot of it. And here's here's the first Planeswalker we see. And we get it. Um, we can't allow Planeswalkers to resolve. When they do, they will just beat us from this position. So we're just buying time. And I consider briefly playing the Batter Skull, but because of its interaction with Mother of Runes, I don't do it. And I leave up the Prohibit. Or the prohibit. We see a Grim Lava Mancer, which is another card that I'm not unhappy to see because I know that, you know, even though it is like a two-for-one sort of card, most of the one-drops in this deck are two-for-one uh, cards <coughs> because they're very powerful. Um, and they, they um, invite some forms of inevitability and card advantage. Um, we do go ahead and get the Soren. Did not play out the Batter Skull again because what's it going to do here? It does nothing against Mother of Runes until I can remove the Mother of Runes. Um, we find our land, which is nice. So now we have Gearhulk um, with Force of Will. You know, unfortunately, it can't be uh, Mystical Confluence. If if Minor had not happened on that turn, I think this game would be well in hand. But Minor did happen on that turn. Now we found our fetch. Uh, we're on quite a few of them in the deck, and Vindicate is now live. So Planeswalker threats, you know, I could allow a Planeswalker to resolve and be okay. So with that in mind, the, the ability to deal with Planeswalker threats um, in mind, um, I play out my Gideon. And Force an Attack. Now, interesting to me, I, I think, I guess he really wanted to cast that, so he didn't want to tap his Mother of Runes and his... Uh, his Grim Lava Mancer. We get very lucky here. Um, we end up destroying the Mancer, and we put a moat down. Uh, we do not have counter magic to back up the moat, but and this is actually so. Here's an interesting part of the game. Um, interesting decision right here. I don't agree with this line. The Gideon should have been destroyed, and if he had been, I don't think my opponent would have lost. I think my opponent would have won this game. Um, the Gideon is left alive though to start ticking up behind the moat, which is going to be problematic over a long enough time horizon. Find Consecrated Sphinx, and we say, hey, you know, let's uh, force him to have instant speed removal. If he does not have instant speed removal, then we're just going to, 
we're going to draw a bunch of cards here. And we're going to basically force a two for one out of him, too. But it appears he, he has the Elspeth, which so he answers the uh, the Consecrated Sphinx. But, I mean, again, it still was a two for one. And because of the fact that we have the Vindicate, we can get rid of that. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're still fairly safe. We're not in a horrible spot. We're trying to draw out of this rut. That's, that card's fine, as, again. Now, interesting choice here. He takes the Batter Skull. I actually think Batter Skull is far worse than Torrential Gear Hulk right here, um, which is another choice that I think may have led to the, the opponent's eventual defeat. Um, Cryptic Command. Eh, always a good one. Well, tell him to keep on attacking me. We actually also make a critical misplay, and I believe it is coming up quite soon. Opponent can still do nothing, and now we have a good counter spell um, up. A better one than uh, than Force of Will, that's for sure, in this position. Um, go ahead and pass it back. And I believe we anticipate end step here. Only find a preordain, which is fine. Preordain is not horrendous. We get that back to start grinding card advantage. Now here's the misplay. Um, so the the issue with this is one. I mean, if he mises, if he mises vindicate, you know, we lose our moat, and our Gideon gets beat up quite severely. Um, we miss tap here. Uh, we should have definitely tapped the scrubland um, and fetched with the windswept teeth with our planes to get the additional land. Um, I don't disagree with the line of play of uh, getting the eternal dragon back and also getting a land with it, so we can have a land drop this turn. Um, it's just straight card advantage. But if we had done it, you know, th in a way that we had tapped uh, um, the planes off of uh, windswept heath as well as scrubland to do it, then we could have left up the disallow to stop this. Um, which would have, uh, you know, shortened the game probably by a large extent. Um, but we screwed up. Um, I just failed to notice that we had our Prairie Stream, our Hollow, our Hollowed Fountain, our Tundra, and our uh, well, this one wouldn't have helped. Um, but we had all of our fetchable uh, white, our blue, white and blue lands in play already. Just wasn't paying attention. So Gideon gets beat up pretty handily, down to four from like thirteen or whatever he was at. But we've got a lot of time here. So the interesting thing is this. So we put the land on the bottom, keep the Jace. Interesting thing is this. Like, we could, we have this Gideon, and we have a Cryptic Command plus a Torrential Gear Hulk, which is a lot of time and a lot of draws. Um, we let the Gideon die here. Because really what my thinking is, is I have to find a Wrath. Like, if I find a Wrath, like I can just blow all this stuff up. It's kind of the game plan I was telling you from the beginning that I was, I was going after, is to allow all this kind of nonsense to resolve. Let him establish, you know, what appears to be board dominance, and then wipe it all away to gain card advantage. Find a swords to plowshares. We draw um, three more. We have a shuffle effect there, though, which is very nice. Um, the plan is now to utilize the cryptic command to forestall his attack after setting the top card of our library, which we actually set at this point in time to be uh, the Dalkin Shackles. Could have gotten humility here, uh, but I don't think humility is that great against this this game plan. Plus, I kind of want my Torrential Gearhawk to do something useful. Um, don't find what we need, but find another Counterspell. Play out the Shackles and pass it back. And we're just hoping to draw through this. And we go ahead and play out the Torrential Gearhawk. Uh, tap Team and draw a card. And still have up uh, essentially two Counterspells, the Pierce and the Knot. We see a Chandra. And you know what we actually do is we go for the Knot here. I want to leave up Pierce as well in case he has a land drop plus an additional Planeswalker threat. Um, that may seem a little bit over careful, but and it's not as efficient. But he has this thing, which I'm actually fine with. I get the Kitchen Finks there um, because that card is recursive. And when I do this, I want it to all be gone. And I really I don't care about his life total. I just want to control. He casts this. My thinking is, is that, hey, I'm going to counter it because I'm going to return the Eternal Dragon and cast it this next turn and assume the beat down at this point, um, which we do. So one minor misplay, I believe, on my part, although the opponent does not punish it. He, he probably top-decked this because I think the right play on his part was to tech-edge 
my fairy uh, conclave, and I should have left my island open so I could not be tech edged. Um, but he cast an Ugin, uh, the spirit dragon, and gets spell pierced here uh, for the win on my side. Um, I, I guess I didn't definitively have the win, but upon untap with a Jace activation um, and a shuffle effect in hand, um, probably probably winning this, um, especially putting him on you know a two turn clock. So that was uh, that was this uh, first uh, game in the match, and the second game I believe was not a game. I believe he mulls to five and concedes it. Yeah, and, and this hand's fine. This hand could have gotten there. I have uh, flexibility in uh, sensor and being on the play with snare against five cards feels pretty good. So the second game was not a game. Um, the third game was against a Red Deck Wins, piloted by ML Berlin. I know this at this point. So, interesting hand. I, I do keep this because if I find one more land, um, I will be able to uh, to play a Trinket Mage to get to my fourth uh, for Factor Fiction, which is kind of my game plan is to get to Factor Fiction, establish six lands, which is pretty crucial in this deck, and then find a win con. Um, the Condescend, I think, is going to help to that end. Um, I do like the Explosives in case he has multiple one-drops, and I have a Swords of Plowshares. Uh, for flexibility against um, any early creature threats. So I play out my tap land first. He plays out a Spark Elemental, which I'm fine with. I'll take three. And then we see all of this nonsense. And here's my thinking. like I, I want to purify the top of my deck and prevent as much damage as possible. Typically speaking, that would not be the case. I would rather just cast the Engineered Explosives and blow up his two one-drops in one setting. Um because it's more card efficient, but it's not more life efficient. Um, and he's obviously kept a two-lander. Interesting line of play here. I think he should have bolted my face and then attacked. I probably would have blocked either way, and he would have gotten one more damage in, because my creature card is not getting more relevant. <clears throat> so we go ahead and factor fiction here. I've opted to go this route. Um, I take the two cards, because I already have two lands. And there's another win con that's, you know, pretty stellar. I just need to get to one of these win cons. We see a price of progress. <coughs> which is still a uh, two, da two mana, four damage burn spell, which is pretty strong. We go ahead and just knock all this stuff out um, just to save life. Because once I get this card online, I don't feel like I can lose. Especially if he's missing on lands. And he finally hits his land. Ditching a uh, burning tree emissary. And... As you see from this point, Chandra does what she does. So I have an interesting line here. Like, depending on what he does this turn, if he just leaves his mana up, I'm probably not going to cast the Torrential Gear Hulk. My thinking is this. Like, if he has a very burn-heavy hand, I could actually cast the Torrential Gear Hulk, getting back the Swords of Plowshares, Swords of Plowsharing my own Torrential Gear Hulk to gain 5 life. That's just good against burn, because I'm going to win the ground fight with an Elsbeth. Um, Elsbeth just does that. Like, it's next to impossible to beat an Elsbeth in a ground fight, uh, especially if you're going card for no cards, you know, every time. So we see a land through Hellion. Land through Hellion, to me, is interesting, because one, I can just block it. It doesn't have trample um, with my 1-1s, one so I don't think it's great here. And two, um, I have the... Uh, my opponent knows I have a Torrential Gear Hulk, which means I can block it for free and also factor fiction. And I, I go with that line, especially if he deems he's going to attack. Because it's essentially a free card uh, for, you know, three more free cards. It's, it, it's like a four for one or a five for one. I mean, I guess they don't really have an option from this position. I don't need the Gideon. I take all the other stuff. I block the land through Hellion. And I have a pretty sizable backswing here. I'm looking for counter magic. I find it. Play out my fetch land. Don't fetch with it, obviously. I want that to dissolve. And spell pierce to stop anything that, like, just wins the game on the spot. You know, like, I don't know, like... Fire Blast plus like another four damage burn spell could do it. Um, I want to be able to stop that kind of those kind of shenanigans. Triple block this guy and then just uh, he opts to, to you know concede the game. Um, game two boarded. Our board is substantial against this deck. I guess red deck wins. Um, it's probably about three quarters of the board because I think this is this this kind of speed aggro with burn backup is a tough matchup for a slower control deck like my own. Um, if it's played well. I have to get this thing. I don't really want to. You know, killing two drops of that card is not really where I want to be, but I am, unfortunately. i go ahead and prohibit this just to buy time. <clears throat> I actually do like Negate and Spell Pierce in this matchup. Play out my other fetch land and say go. 
he opts to come in with his key two encampment, making it a 4-1, which is a pretty painful swing. I can't do anything about it, though. I can't unexpectedly absent it, unfortunately. And I get a very good draw there in Elizabeth, so I have a win con now, and I think it's time for me to play it. He actually still shoots my face, which I'm fine with. We see a very, another very good, strong pickup there. Um, but I don't play it this turn. I opt to unexpectedly absent his uh, Stormblood Berserker, because if he doesn't have Burn, it's actually very bad. He casts this thing out, which is uh, fine, you know. Although, interesting, I think he would have made more money off of it if he had cast it on my turn. <clears throat> we block there because we're just looking for time right now. We do play out the Warmth, and then we play out the Trinket Mage, leaving up uh, Spell Pierce after getting um, the Seed of the Synod. See, a Thunderous Wrath. Um, here, I could have opted to Spell Pierce this. I don't. Like, the worst card for me is, like, I don't know, a Sulfuric Vortex or something. See this card? And I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's going to be card advantage for him, which is a rarity for Red Deck Wins, so you de generally want to deny him that. But um, it's not the end of the world. He has no attacks again. Find another land. Not great. Don't really need more mana at this point. We see a skull crack to set up his 3-3 uh, three, three menace. We allow it, actually, because at this point, I, I can generally, I can pretty favorably uh, fight with this board. Then we draw another bomb, moat, and we put this down, pump up the trinket mage, and uh, the game's just over from this position. And I think he draws, and he knows it, and says, okay, well, you got me. Especially from 15 life with a warmth in play. It's going to be pretty tough to, to win that. Unless you draw like your Anarchy. And even then, like I have two answers for Anarchy in, in my hand. Um, so, that was that game. The last game was against player Michelle Wong. Uh, and it was a Mono Blue versus Esper um, Control. Kind of mirror match, I would say. Because the proponents of my deck does rely on Blue to function. Vidalkin Shackle is not great, but I have my lands. I have a sensor to, uh, to filter for more lands if I want, which I do. Um, I miss twice on lands there, so I'm looking to use the Condescent on her turn if she casts something relevant, even if she casts pretty much anything. See a land, which is nice, so I'm up to three at this point. <clears throat> but I hope to have more. Um, and this is the point where things start coming off the tracks. Probably should have actually, I don't know, it may have been smart to try to counter that, because she's just hitting her land drops left and right. I am not. Moat is a dead card as well, or pretty close to dead. So the problem you'll find with this specific build of this deck is it's not as strong against control. I have one silver bullet in the sideboard, which becomes very relevant. But right now I'm drawing dead. Um, like You see like Days of Judgment, um, Moats, you know, cards like that are really not great against her deck. I finally hit a land here, which is nice. And I believe she tries to cast a Factor Fiction here. No, a Vencer. I go ahead and counter the Vencer um, because, you know, at the end of the day, like, I really can't beat having my land put back into my hand at this point. And I go ahead and condescend this to Scry. I put both in the bottom because I need, like, an O-Ring effect to deal with that. Plus, I need to have Counter Magic Backup, which is looking pretty unlikely. Um, I keep at this point. This is better than a Shuffle. Miss Land again. This turn, she ends up playing, I believe, a, um, a Dust Bowl, which is the end of the game. From this position and this far behind, I just concede it because I can't win this game from this point. Um, a Card Advantage Engine plus, you know, Mana Denial Engine is just going to be game. So we go to game two. Um, only had, uh, I believe, two board cards. Gainsay plus Sphinx of the final word. This hand's great against her. The Wrath is not so good, but, like, it just lands. Um, you really can't miss with it. I don't play an untapped land. I just play um, the tapped one. If she wants to force spike my preordain, she can. Play another tapped land. Um, Could have played my, my island I previously showed, but or had shown. I didn't really care to. Um, didn't think it mattered that much. If she wants to counter on her turn, that's her prerogative. People normally won't in these kind of mirrors. I do go ahead and counter this. Um, I don't want to give her the information because my hand is not really that great. Um, it's 
it's good when they don't know it, I guess as, as a way to put it, because I do want to make land drops every turn. I think it is, is very important to this matchup. But I don't, know, I don't want her to know when she can strike um, or what my density of counter magic is, which right now just got a lot better. So I get off the aggro plan I had previously initiated when I was only leaving the gate up. I see a Dust Bowl, which at this point is fine because I've just, I had an all-land hand, and if she wants to spend her time and mana burning up her lands uh, without a card engine online, that's fine with me. As you see, she doesn't really want to do that. And we draw this guy. Um, let's just say, like, this guy is pretty much just good games. Um, yeah, I think she's, like, laughing. Because, like, that card is just ridiculous. So, I don't think the card is per se a great... I, I could have countered that as well. I don't care to. Like, it can't bounce my Sphinx. Like, what's it going to do? Like, what can it find? Like, outside of, like, upheaval, which I can even counter then, like, there's not much she can do against this card. All I have to do is play it, sit behind some counter magic, counter only the things that will lose me the game, and just sit back and hit for five a turn. Um, pretty much that easy. Get the Torrent Gear Hall, because it's essentially an additional counter spell. And just hang out. <clears throat> yeah, she blows up one of my lands. It's fine. Again, at this point, if that's how she's spending her mana, I'm okay with it. I do counter this. I want to just get deeper in the deck, plus set up the Torrential Gear Hulk. She attempts to counter back, uh, I think, without reading... Um, that one cryptic command is at this point uncounterable, and Sphinx has made it so. Um, draw a land, play it. Um, if she, like I said, if she wants to use her time and mana and energy, blowing up my lands at the expense of one of hers every time, she can do that. Not a big deal for me. We go ahead and cast this guy. I, I think it, I thought it was end step. Somehow we got stuck on on her main. I get mana leak. That's fine. What I was going to do is actually uh, bounce one of her lands back to hand and draw a card and up my clock so I could win this next turn. That did not come to pass, though, and we blow up another land, and um, she uh, cast a cryptic command. I say, no, thank you, ma'am, and attack her and kill her with Sphinx of the Final Word. So game three... <clears throat> Not a great hand, but fine. Good enough. Play out the tapped land. Thought Scour. Dropping, you know, a Planeswalker and a, uh, a Peak. <coughs> Keep the Factor Fiction here. Draw Jace. Strong draw. Factor Fiction's a game breaker. Keep the land and the Unexpectedly Absent. Unexpectedly Absent, I think, is a fine card in this matchup, too putting irrelevant cards on top of her deck or library or even relevant ones that are already in play is, it seems pretty good to me. Just blank draw steps. So my, my thing is here, I decided to go for the Factor Fiction so I can try to resolve a Jace on the following turn. She has the Negate, which is fine. I draw this, though, and I say, well, let's do it another turn. He goes for a Brainstorm. We see this card, I'm like, ah, fine, that's fine by me. I guess she saw the Torrential Gear Hulk and probably figures I have a Snapcaster. I draw this guy again, and I'm like, well, I'll keep both these because one of them allows me to cycle into land, and the other one is a land. So with Sphinx of the Steel, or correction, Sphinx of the Final Word in hand, my assumption is, like, I probably can't be beat if I can hit my land drops. Um, she plays around that she has a spell pierce. She does not there. So in that exchange, it ended pretty favorably for us. We went up on cards. She plays her Jace out. What I have to do is go for a Trinket Mage. Luckily, did not get Pithing Needle. I just get Vindicate online and leave up one mana to fight against uh, Force Spike if she managed to draw it in the last turn. And then uh, the same thing happens. We drop this guy again, and she's like, oh, goodness, what do I do? Really, there's not much you do do against this card. It's just, it, it is a, in tr truth and lending is, it's a silver bullet against the style of deck she is playing. Um... And I do not think it can be beat <laughs> by her deck. Um, so once we have it, the game of magic kind of ends. If we had not had it, we likely would have gone for uh, Jace the Mind Sculptor of our own, plus uh, Vindicate option, which would have been equally strong and probably led to inevitability. But not the sort of inevitability that Sphinx of the Final Word does in this matchup once we're on the, on the board with her. 
She used to bounce stuff and, you know, try to make things happen. Jump on cards, but, I mean, we're the beat down here. Um, so all we got to do is beat down. Uh, we get Shadow Adapted here, which is uh, okay. <clears throat> it's unfortunate because it, would, it costs us two islands, but, I mean, right now it doesn't. it's not really, frankly, that relevant. And we see a Torrential Gear Hulk. Allow her to cast it. <clears throat> Buying a lot of time, but like, you know, for what? You know, what are what is she drawing to? What are her ounce? Play this guy. Um I believe put the land or not not the land, but the um the detention sphere, um, plus another irrelevant card um on the top. <clears throat> and path to exile, um, her uh, torrential gear elk. Attack again. Hopefully we don't cast the pie the needle and it breaks this video. <laughs> and preordain after having bounced our, our Jace as well. We go ahead and go for our own torrential gear hulk. <clears throat> I don't know why she did that. Maybe she was trying to tempt us to attack the Jace. I was like, no, no, thank you. I don't feel like attacking your Jace. And I can't think of anything in three three blue mana. That will do it here. So I just counter that to end the game. And the game ends. Um, Sphinx of the final word, or just in general, silver bullets. Sometimes they can win you games. They do require very exacting uh, meta calls. Um, I think you're generally better with more flexible and cards that have better range in your sideboard. Um, but this guy definitely did some earning this time around and uh, and definitely helped uh, win this match. Not help. He, he won this match uh, pretty much single-handedly. Uh, both the games we won in it. So I hope you guys enjoyed the recap of uh, the play uh, from this last uh, Chainsaw Massacre. Sorry for the Pything Needle break in one of them, and also apologies for lack of audio um, in the uh, in the live series that I did for this one. But I hope this helps explain some of the play um, that I made uh, during it. If you have any questions, uh, please uh, either contact me on YouTube or uh, shoot me an email or hit me up in MTG Salvation. And uh, take care.